and not even realize that you're available to them. Anyway, ferron grindry landmarks uh, are easily identified, um, and you can see in a moment how these uh, will change when you move that mandible around. Uh, you'll, it's very interesting when you look at pharyngometry in live time, you'll see the airway collapse at many levels, not just where the tongue is. Most people, like I did, they think that all the problems in the world are collapsing uh, where the tongue is, because if you have a big tongue, you're going to have sleep apnea. So why not just do surgery? Well, we, that's what we used to think, but until we had real data, <clears throat> we didn't know better. We know that about 80% of the time airways collapse not just at the tongue but below the tongue in the hypopharynx as well. And so we now know with this knowledge when to refer and not to refer for surgery. And surgery generally as a <clears throat> is, is woefully uh, inadequate for a lot of sleep apneics because of this concept that they collapse at more than just the area they can get, their, um, <clears throat> get to surgically. In some, uh, you, in some instances, yes, you can pick up people who are more likely to be responsive to the surgery and help prevent a, lot, a big problem. <clears throat> um, I'll just make another comment about pharyngometry. The way we use it in our practice of dental sleep medicine is we will we'll get an appliance ready and we'll have them advance their jaw. <clears throat> and using pharyngometry, we can see at what position we need to move that jaw towards uh, before the airway dilates and, stay, and remains stable. Uh, there are a number of um, portable monitors that are available, and we have a series of them. Um, uh, on, on here you can see the Aries, the Snap, the Embleta. Uh, these are very easy to use. They're done at home, and people can sleep with these monitors. And de depending on the type of monitor you purchase, You'll, have, you'll, you'll receive a certain level of information. Some of these can be used for making a diagnosis of sleep apnea, a hard diagnosis which will open up medical benefits for that patient for which they can receive treatment. <clears throat> it has to be done under the guidance or the support of a qualified physician. That's, that's, how, we, uh, that's how it's being done at, at this moment. But uh, these, these are also excellent if you're trying to get people um, uh, treated sufficiently uh, who have been referred to you, for example, because of their CPAP intolerance, to have these monitors available so you can see how close they are to getting a full response or not to your mandibular advancement device saves them a trip uh, back and forth from the hospital and <clears throat> wasting a lot of insurance dollars because you haven't quite got to that end point in titration. <clears throat> Suffice to say that portable monitors are being utilized and have an emerging role in the diagnosis and management of sleep disordered breathing, particularly in the dental sleep practice where monitoring, uh, because these, uh, the appliances we use have to be titrated over time, is very efficient and uh, very effective. Well, why, do, why even mess with this? CPAP works. I mean, you know, I, that, I've been told that's, that's the thing. Well. You know, uh, Dr. Colin Sullivan from Australia, who got this thing going back in the 80s, he had a great idea. And CPAP works 100% of the time when you wear it. <clears throat> the fact is that CPAP, for a lot of people, is difficult to wear long term because of, its, because of the restrictions to sleep and movement, the straps, the claustrophobia, I can't breathe through my nose, I'm a mouth breather. It's, it is a, truly a godsend when it works because it works so well. But what about, let's say it's 30%, 50%, I don't whatever. Let's say, let's say, what about the percentage of people who have sleep apnea and can't tolerate CPAP? And if you, depending on the research that you accept, it can be anywhere from, you know, 80% down to 20 percent. Okay, well those folks who can't tolerate treatment, surgery doesn't work about 70 percent of the time, and they don't want a tracheotomy yet, so what are their options? Well a lot of people think, and the research, the evidence-based research shows that for mild to moderate sleep apneas, for UARS, the sleepy snorers, and for snoring just in general, oral devices work very, very well. <clears throat> but, uh, but CPAP uh, is more efficacious. I mean, why, why don't we just, 
CPAP is more efficacious, it is more effective, but it's not tolerated well uh, by many people. And so if, if it doesn't work for them and oral devices are very effective, <clears throat> we're obliged to, to make that knowledge available to people so they don't die from their disease. Sleep apnea will lead to a lot of medical problems, uh, heart attacks, strokes, and a lot of suffering along the way. And so we, uh, we're, we're compelled to get the word out that just because you're CPAP intolerant doesn't mean you have to die from the disease because nothing else will work. CPAP works well. A lot of people have a hard time with it, and that's just a fact. Um, and I wish it were otherwise, but that's the way it is. Uh, again, C CPAP compliance or uh, people hanging with it, uh, the, the numbers uh, range tremendously. Uh, but I would say it's, it's safe to say that most people would, would agree that half the people can't handle it and half the people love it. And so for the 50%, in my opinion, of the group who can't, are we going to write them off? Uh, no, we don't have to at all. We just have to understand that we have a role that we can play in managing this medical, appliance, uh, uh, medical problem. And it's oral appliances. Oral appliances can be very effective in treating and fixing a lot of these uh, problems, you know, we'll say the mild to moderates often respond very well and it's a fix. For the severes, maybe half of those people will get significantly improved from oral appliances. And for the balance of people who don't do, uh, don't get sufficient healing, we know it's about seven to one that people prefer oral appliances over CPAP and that's not, that's not knocking CPAP, that's just they can tolerate it better. And of the people who don't get enough healing from oral appliances alone, we can work with the sleep doctor and make the pressure requirements for CPAP therapy much more tolerable by virtue of wearing a mouthpiece concurrently with the CPAP because if you have the airway halfway open, the pressures required to get it the rest of the way are significantly less. And there are some devices now that you can connect to the mask or you can even make a customized mask yourself and you, you can learn how to do that, that hooks to your mouthpiece that stabilizes it such that you don't even need straps. You can be on your side, on, in any position, and the mask will stay in place and won't leak. So oral devices have a huge and, believe me, emerging role in managing these problems. It's, it's bigger than I've got time to discuss today. And, uh, and I could go on and on, and I'll be rambling, but uh, suffice to say, if you're, if you're in a practice and you have any TMD patients at all, if you have kids who are at least a bit hy hyperactive, if you have any adults who just can't seem to lose weight, and if, if maybe a couple this year have recession that you can't understand, um, never mind the person just sent to you because they can't manage CPAP, there's a whole lot out there. And, um, and you, you owe it to yourself to gain more knowledge about uh, the role that dentists play in the management of these very troublesome problems. Thank you.